All right, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome. Let's get started. We have a wonderful lecture tonight um, by a good friend of mine, Tom Leslie, who is the Moral Professor in Architecture at Iowa State University. I think he and I almost overlapped at the University of Illinois, where he studied, and then uh, had gone on to uh, Columbia. Uh, prior to teaching, he worked with Norman Foster and Partners in London, and worked on some exciting projects in Omaha, Nebraska, and Rydia, and uh, Stanford University Clinical Sciences Research Project. He's the author of several notable books uh, that I've showed some of my students in class this week. Uh, one on Louis Kahn, uh, Building Art, Building Science, Chicago Skyscrapers, and the one I think we're going to hear about tonight, the most recent, Beauty's Rigor, Patterns of Production in the Work of Pierre-Luigi Nervi. His research uh, in historical relationship between engineering, design, and construction has been funded by several notable organizations, National Endowment for Humanities, the Graham Foundation, American Philosophical Society. His research has been published widely, including in the Journal of Architectural Education, Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians, Construction History, Design Issues, Technology and Culture, and I think Tom is here this week as well. Why I tapped him on his visit while he was in Providence for the Society of Architectural Historians Conference. He has appeared as an expert in several uh, realms in the BBC World Service, uh, Australia Broadcasting Corporation, New York Times, etc. Also, I share with my students this morning uh, Architecture Farm, uh, and that's his blog on WordPress which is an active online research notebook and there's a posting I think just last week uh, having to do with the tragic collapse uh, and fire at Notre Dame Cathedral. So if you want to know a little bit more about that and the history of that roof, you can uh, check out the architecture farm. He has quite a teaching resume as well, uh, one of his passions. Uh, he's held visiting positions at uh, University of Technology Sydney in Australia. Uh, the Bauhaus University in Weimar, Germany, University of Bologna, and the McCormick School of Engineering at Northwestern, where he's a full adjunct professor. He's won several awards, including from the Association Collegiate Schools of Architecture, U.S. Green Building Council, and the AIA. And most recently, Tom was just sharing with me the, uh, the what do they call it, all the rights and privileges there, too. He's been awarded a fellowship in the American Institute of Architects. So please give a warm Bristol welcome to Tom Leslie. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, so my, uh, as Bob said, my research looks at the way that engineering and construction and design relate to and, and influence one another. Yes. Oh, I, you really only need to see the screen. Um, uh, and so that's been my teaching, uh, but that also stems from where I practice. Right? Foster's is one of these firms that believes that uh, engineering and construction give us as architects the kind of grammar or language that, that we work with. Um, and uh, one of the examples that I've used continuously in, in teaching and one of the great heroes in Foster's office uh, was this Italian designer and builder named Pier Luigi Nervi. Uh, so Nervi had always been a kind of familiar name uh, and I, I knew about him as an engineer and knew that he was the designer of these incredible kind of lacy, almost spiderweb-like roofs uh, in Italy and elsewhere that had achieved so much notoriety, uh, especially in the 1960s. And I wanted to kind of see if, if I could figure out or, or um, uh, help to understand why Nervi's roofs, why Nervi's designs seem to attract so much attention and so much um, so much critical love when other long spans of the era did not. And the example that I uh, sort of use all the time is comparing Nervi's Palazzetto dello Sport, a building that um, we'll come around to here in a little bit, um, with a, a reinforced concrete shell structure that's much bigger, should be much more impressive, uh, the Kingdom in Seattle, which was uh, so much loved that uh, less than 20 years after it was built, it was torn down. Right, or 25 years after it was built, it was torn down, right? and generally regarded as, as a, a supremely kind of ugly building. Great accomplishment, right? a much bigger building than Nervi's, so why do we respond so well to one and so kind of poorly to the other? And the sort of working hypothesis is that Nervi was more than kind of just an engineer or more than just a builder but it was the relationship between these two kind of realms that, that, that make his buildings uh, so, so special, so, um, so compelling uh, 
when other shell structures of the era maybe aren't so much. So uh, this project was to go back and, and to try to trace Nervi's career and to see what made him different, basically, from other designers, other engineers at the time. And in fact, you can go all the way back to his uh, college days. Professors are very important uh, in, in our um, development as designers. And Nervi uh, attended the University of Bologna, uh, which had one of the best civil engineering programs uh, in Europe at the time when he went in the uh, early or uh, mid, uh, mid 1910s. And he had two professors in particular um, that he wrote about frequently. Uh, one of them, Silvio Canavazzi, on the left, was a theoretician, uh, what we might think of as a kind of white collar uh, academic, um, didn't practice, but was one of the leading uh, theorists of hyperstatic structures. Concrete is still a relatively new structural material. Uh, it's very difficult to figure out the, the kind of statics of it because there's so many possible load paths. And Canavazzi was one of the ones who started the, the mathematical process of trying to calculate in concrete. <coughs> Um, the other one, uh, Tilia Ugia, was exactly the opposite. Um, he is what today we might call a professor of practice. He had his own uh, contracting firm, and he taught uh, not reinforced concrete theory, but reinforced concrete construction. So how you actually go out and kind of form uh, the, the material into the shapes that kind of Atsi is, is trying to understand from a, from a mathematical point of view. And these end up being two opposite poles, but very important influences in Nervi's life. He went on to not only become a capital E engineer, someone who designs and calculates structures, but he had a second firm that actually went out and built the buildings that he himself designed. Um, Nervi's apprenticeship was with Mugia. He was one of these like straight A students who the professor hires right out of school. And he uh, was superintended a lot of Lugia's work in and around Florence, and particularly in this one town called Prata that has always been a, a center of Italy's textile industry. Um, these projects are super straightforward, kind of boring, reinforced concrete factory buildings um, built in an era when concrete was kind of ascendant uh, in industry because it was uh, both fireproof and kind of uh, easy to, to build. But they uh, occurred at, at what you may notice was a particularly interesting and particularly fraught time uh, in Italian history. Um, Mussolini took over in 1922, and by 1934, when, by, the, by which point Nervi had um, taken on uh, ownership of his own firm and, and then started building buildings on his own, um, fascism uh, had taken over Italy completely. Mussolini had invaded Ethiopia, and the rest of the world had basically cut Italy off from world trade. Um, Mussolini had this idea that that was going to be fine. Italy doesn't need the rest of the world. We can supply all of our own uh, building material, all of our own food. Um, and Nervi had this kind of um, uh, falling out, in a way. Uh, early on, he actually was elected president of the fascist syndicate of engineers in Florence. But within a year, he resigned because he felt that the, the strictures being imposed on engineers and builders uh, were kind of unhealthy, a fairly brave thing to do. And the, the sort of other piece of this is that, uh, in fact, uh, Italy did not have a whole lot of uh, building material on its own. It's kind of um, fortunate to have a huge variety of stone. Um, but these two maps tell a very different story about how you might build in the 20th century. Um, on the left is a map of all of the iron ore deposits uh, in Europe in 1913. And on the right, the other thing that you need to produce steel uh, is a lot of fuel, a lot of coal at the time. And as you can see, uh, Italy is, is burdened neither with extensive iron ore deposits nor with extensive coal deposits. Um, it has one little mine on the island of Elba and basically no coal. Um, the other thing that is sort of interesting about Italy's natural resources is they have no old growth timber. Because since the Roman era, um, people on the Italian peninsula had been harvesting and farming timber not only for their buildings, but also for fuel. They have no coal, therefore they have to burn their trees to heat their houses for, for most of the, of, the, of the last two millennia. So in fact, this kind of brave idea that Italy can go it alone is completely wrong-headed. 
and Italy can't build with steel because it has to import every bit of steel that, that comes into the country. It's possible, but with all the embargoes that come into play in the 1930s, it becomes very difficult. And you can imagine very quickly why you would build in concrete uh, instead of in steel. Um, <clears throat> Nervi, sort of bravely, uh, by 1938, is, is publicly uh, against this idea of um, what's called autarky, or building using only what, what you have to hand with, within your country. Um, Mussolini and the fascists want all of the contractors, all of the architects in Italy, to go back to this Roman way of building with brick and building uh, with travertine. And Nervi writes a, an editorial, the national paper in 1938, <clears throat> where he basically says that um, this seems to be a very kind of native way to build, and it certainly looks like it, right? Mussolini's maybe more interested in um, sort of recalling the, the grandeur of the Roman Empire than, than a really serious attempt at, at efficient building. Um, but Nervi says that, that this it essentially ignores what the engineer can do. And he says that if you take just a little bit of steel that we can get in Italy and use it wisely to reinforce a concrete construction, you can actually build for less money than if you rely on just native materials alone. The buildings are lighter, uh, they don't uh, require so much labor, they don't require so much fuel to make bricks uh, and things like this. So Nervi has this idea of um, taking the very limited resources that he has available and trying to, to kind of make the most of them. And very soon he moves from Florence to Rome uh, he builds uh, this uh, apartment block on, along the Tiber, uh, just north of Piazza del Popolo. He moves his engineering office into the first floor, and he moves his family into the top floor. And this is where Nervi lives and practices for the rest of his for the rest of his life. That is the kind of white collar professional office that he has. The the kind of legacy of Canavazzi. At the same time, though, Nervi and first his cousin, and then a business partner, uh, Bartoli. Um, open up a, a, a contracting firm, and they buy some land south of Rome in the Maliana district, and they open up a, a contractor's yard where they can both kind of store material, but also where they can experiment. Uh, this is one of their experiments that still exists. In 1946, this is a, a prefabricated uh, warehouse out of a material that I'll talk about in a second called ferro cement. And so I sort of imagine Nervi like in the morning going in like necktie, white collar, um, doing the calculations, writing all the correspondence, and then in the afternoon kind of rolling up his sleeves, going out into the job site yard and, and with his workforce getting his hands dirty and experimenting with ways to form and, and to make uh, concrete. Again, these two kind of opposite poles, right? Thinking about the design and thinking about the, the construction. Um, he and, and Bartoli are, are uh, wildly successful. They get a commission uh, in two stages for uh, the, the football grounds in Florence, which is still used by Fiorentina. Um, in 1930, with Nebbiosi, his cousin, who's a little more conservative, they build the main grandstand with uh, this cantilevered roof that um, attracts a lot of attention for its sort of daring, swooping form. Uh, and then with Bartoli, uh, his new business partner in 1932, they build the other grandstand where Nervi solves an architectural problem, which is uh, how you, you bring people in from the back of the grandstand so they can fill up from, from field level up um, with these giant kind of helical staircases. Uh, difficult to calculate, uh, very tough to build, um, but you can almost imagine Nervi like realizing that he now has the tools with which he can experiment. He can calculate stuff in his office, he can go try out the formwork and see whether things work in the, in the job site yard or the job yard. Uh, and so when he goes on site to build something, um, this maybe is the third or fourth time that he's tried a uh, technique of forming. Uh, so he can build more daring structures than, than most contractors would uh, be asked to build. He can design them uh, more daring than um, most engineers would, would be comfortable with. So as Italy uh, slides toward World War II, um, the steel crisis uh, gets worse and worse. And uh, finally, the Air Force, in kind of desperation for new hangars for its planes, uh, sends out a call for a uh, competition that will design hangars in concrete instead of in steel. And 
NERVI responds with a, a proposal for a very efficient structural form. Um, this is the, the hang of the ends of building. And as you can see, it's, it's what's called a lamella structure, uh, but done in concrete instead of timber or, or steel, which is what, what we normally see these in. Um, it's a vaulted roof, so it, it relies in part on kind of arch action in one direction. Um, and it's uh, the, the lamella forms do two things. One is they basically take a, a very thin shell concrete roof and stiffen it. But you can think about it another way. They basically trick the concrete into thinking that it's much thicker than it really is. Right? So it's a little bit like a coffered ceiling, like the, the Pantheon, removing a lot of the dead weight from what would otherwise be a very heavy, very thick uh, roof structure. Um, this is propped up on a, a, a set of 36 buttresses around the back, three buttresses across the front, and you can see that there's a giant uh, truss, triangular truss, that goes across the opening. And this is both taking the, the gravity load of, of the roof, but it's also taking the thrust, the tendency of the shell to spread out uh, and restraining it. So it's a beam in, in two directions. Very, very clever piece of structural engineering. Uh, it gets published not only in Italy, but also uh, worldwide. And Nerevi is sort of hailed as this kind of genius who's figured out how to create an aircraft hangar, which usually, uh, by this point, people are used to seeing in a lightweight material like steel uh, or lumber, uh, in this very heavy and, importantly, very kind of native material of reinforced concrete. Um, Nerevi is not quite so happy with it, though. Even though it gets praised uh, for, for its kind of structural daring, um, he later points out that, in fact, um, this building had a lot of problems. And uh, in particular, he said he, he was frustrated by the fact that in reinforced concrete, you have to build the building twice. You have to build it first with formwork and scaffolding. So you're using a lot of timber, scarce timber in Italy. And he said then, you know, the, the roof in concrete still, even with all the coffering, even with the, the lamellar structure, was so heavy that when all of these ribs came down onto those buttresses, as you can see in the, the construction detail on the right, he said basically we were building a steel building anyway because the reinforcing was so intense, right? There was so much reinforcing in it. Um, and he's very quiet about this. He doesn't come out and say it until uh, well after World War II. Um, but he, he thinks uh, that, that between his kind of engineering and his contracting skills, like it must be possible to do this better. He goes back to his job site yard and he begins to play around with ways of making similar hangar forms out of precast units. And this lets him do a couple of things. Uh, one, if you're casting on the ground instead of up in the, the air, um, you can use a, the same form over and over again. You can make these units in, uh, in one timber form on the ground. As they cure, you can pick them up and, and, and put them into place and then reuse the, the formwork on the ground. You can also make much more complicated shapes this way. So you can see here in an in experimental span that he's uh, building in Maliana uh, that he's looking at ways of basically building what I think of as a virendeal arch, right? A, a, a truss arch that uses moment connections and it takes all of the dead weight around what, what would be that arch's neutral axis. So saving, as you can see, like 60, 70% of the weight of that uh, arch, and at the same time finding ways to make it faster, to, to cast on the ground. He realizes, too, that you can, um, uh, you can sort of telescope the construction time. So while you're pouring all the foundations and, and getting all the, the substructure done, uh, another crew can be casting all of these members, and you can have all of the kind of pieces ready to go uh, by the time that the foundations are ready, right? So you cut the time of the, the construction in half. The problem with this, of course, is that all of these precast units have to still connect to one another. And to take advantage of concrete, they have to perform as a monolithic uh, shell. Um, there is a sketch in the Nervi archives that you can see on the upper left, where I, I think he kind of figures out how to do this. Um, what you're looking at there is four precast units each with a little hoop of wire or rebar. And that octagonal shape is basically a, re a concrete plug. And once all of those precast units are in place, they just form that little octagonal box, uh, pour some uh, concrete into that, and as that cures, it latches on to all the various rebar 
and gives a, a monolithic connection to the, to the joints. Multiply this by a, a few hundred throughout the roof of a hangar, and you have a, a roof that is kind of sufficiently monolithic uh, or hyperstatic. Um, here, again, in Maliani, he's playing around with how you actually build this. You can see, again, Virendil truss pieces. And if you look closely, you can see just little bits of rebar sticking out into those joints. So he's taking the, the minimal, minimum possible amount of steel, deploying it only where he actually needs it, uh, and then using these reinforced concrete plugs to make sure that those joints are monolithic, that they, they'll connect uh, pieces together. As he's doing this, he realizes that he's saving uh, weight, which saves money, saves on foundations, saves on rebar at the, at the connections. He's saving time, because these can be precast while the foundations are, are being built. And he realizes that he's also um, saving money in terms of the equipment that he's going to need to rent. Because if you make all of these pieces small enough that you just need a small crane to hoist them into place instead of a big crane, then Nervi doesn't have to go out and, and spend the money on one of these giant uh, boom cranes, right? He can build with smaller pieces of equipment. Um, his firm is a, a, a fairly small, like, family-run firm. They don't own their own cranes. Uh, and, and this is something I think that we rarely think about, that the size of the pieces that you're trying to lift has a direct bearing on the cost of the construction because you've got to rent the equipment to actually lift those pieces. So here, um, later in, in Lectures to Architects, he's talking about this project, a, a, a freeway viaduct uh, in Italy. And he says that because of the, the, the um, fatal reliance on economy, that's what actually determined the spans of this viaduct. And likewise, when he's building these hangars, the second round of hangars, um, he's found ways to uh, not only reduce the size of the crane, but as you can see from uh, this shot, to actually get rid of the crane entirely. Right? This is a, a traveling scaffold that kind of has been driven along the length of the hangar. It has winches and pulleys that allow people to lift or work them to lift those truss pieces uh, up into place. You can see that he's changed from a bearing deal system to a, a more traditional uh, triangular truss. That is him on the left with the tie hand in pocket uh, looking very pleased, right? As, as well he should. Um, what's kind of fascinating about, there are a bunch of things that are fascinating about this round of hangers that he did uh, in the midst of, of World War II. Um, one is that he's reduced the number of buttresses from 36 uh, down to six. Um, he, you can see that he's taken out virtually uh, all the weight of the roofs of the roof and the arches. Um, this system is monolithic enough that he came back and instead of a, a port in place shell, um, he just put kind of um, uh, asbestos shingles over the top to keep the rain out. So much less weight. Um, he's saved on scaffolding because this uh, thing here can just travel along the length of the hangars. Saved on foundations, saved on time. And at the end of the project, he does something very interesting. Instead of just having his workmen take kind of job site pictures like we're sort of all used to, he sees this hangar being completed. This is the, the first one that was finished uh, on the coast of Italy at Torre del Lago. And he calls uh, Studio Vasari, which is Rome's best known architectural photographer. And he says, come out, and before the roof gets put on this one, I, I want you to take some architectural photographs of it. This is interesting because these are allegedly pure engineering structures. Uh, in fact, in the archives, there are, are a handful of drawings that show what the building is going to look like, right? what the hangar is going to look like. But there are literally hundreds of drawings where Nervi is doing the graphic statics on the left to figure out how the, the hangar is going to work as a piece of structure. Hundreds of drawings that are basically shop drawings showing what the, each truss piece is going to have to look like, what its dimensions will have to be to, to go into place, and dozens and dozens of drawings of the scaffolding that Nervi used to actually erect the, the, the pieces. There are almost no drawings that we would think of as architectural. Right? He didn't really think about what it was going to look like until he saw this process at its completion at the end and realized that almost accidentally he had come around to making architecture, right? Not just building, not just engineering, but something that solved the problem and was truly beautiful uh, at the end. So there's one set of lessons there, right? A really refined process, right? Born out of 
really, really difficult conditions, leading almost accidentally to something that is truly beautiful, right? truly kind of um, compelling aesthetically. During World War II, he gets a second commission from the Italian military that is even more pressing. Um, in addition to not having steel for hangars, uh, the military doesn't have any steel to build ships. And they also don't have any timber to build ships. And the Navy goes to the country's engineers and says, we're kind of open to suggestions. And uh, Nervi responds by saying he thinks he can build boats and ships out of concrete. And the Navy gives him a commission for four uh, demonstration halls. Um, this is, these are two of them uh, that you see here. Um, they give him a, a, a shipyard that has no power and no equipment and basically say, good luck. And what Nervi does uh, is to borrow a kind of old French technique that in Italian is called ferro cemento, which you can see the detail here on the left. I'll show this uh, in, in a bit more detail uh, here in a second. It's a way of making a very, very thin sheet of uh, concrete that's reinforced with very, very light steel mesh. You can see there are a couple of rebars there. Those uh, are basically uh, the, the kind of um, the lofting lines. Um, I can use terminology like that in Bristol, right? You all know about ship design. In the Midwest, you say like lofting lines, people are like, what are you talking about, right? Here, maybe it's a little different. Yeah. Um, so you can see that he's got to make complex curves. So he uses what little rebar he can get, not necessarily for reinforcing, but as kind of the way to get this three-dimensional hull shape into space. Once he's done that, all the dash lines are these layers of thin metal mesh, um, expensive but possible to get uh, in Italy. And then into the metal mesh, he gets uh, laborers, mostly unskilled, to just trowel a lightweight, aggregate-free cement into the kind of uh, voids between all of, all of these screens. And when all of that cures, the, what little steel there is, is distributed throughout the concrete so completely that ferrocement works sort of partially like concrete, but also a little bit like steel. It's tough, it's ductile, it can take bending, it's sort of perfect for shipbuilding. Um, these four hulls get uh, built by 1942. Uh, Italy has essentially abandoned its navy. Uh, they sit kind of uh, decaying, but they do get tested, and they, they survive all the kind of torture tests uh, that, the, that the Navy uh, does to them. Later in life, Nervi comes back and builds his own sailboat for his family out of Ferro cement. Um, so the, the, there's kind of proof of concept. What Nervi realizes, though, is that if you take this kind of shipbuilding technique and turn it into an, a fabricational technique for architecture, you can take these prefabrication ideas that he has and sort of supercharge them. So ferro-cement, he realizes, um, you can go from a three inch thick prefabricated piece to a piece that's more like one and a half inches. So you save 50% of the weight of concrete, which means you save on all the structure that holds that up. Um, you can see here, this is one of the stadia that, that Nervi did for the Olympics. And he's using very lightweight cranes to, to pick up uh, roof elements made out of ferro cement that will be placed into yet another cantilever roof over the stadium. Um, this is the Flaminio today. It's, it's kind of a ruin, but um, I've been lucky to be part of the group, some of whom you see here, who've convinced the city of Rome to restore this building, and particularly to restore uh, this very innovative roof. It's basically built out of dozens of little ship hulls made out of ferro cement. So Nervi has uh, this kind of library of techniques. Um, he, he's found a way to prefabricate concrete, to connect uh, prefabricated concrete in a way that, that gets him the benefits of reinforced concrete. He's found a way to supercharge even that into this kind of magic material that works sort of like a concrete, sort of like steel. And all of this has come about through processes that, are, um, that, that don't require a lot of equipment and that are kind of algorithmic in a way that we don't often think of, right? We think of algorithmic design as being super complex. Nervi doesn't have grasshopper or anything like that. Um, what he has are uh, basically unskilled laborers and not a lot of power or lifting equipment. And so he's had to find a way to make all of this stuff basically with hand labor and to take all of the kind of craftsmanship 
out of the process and to find ways to use very, very simple, repetitive techniques to get very complex forms built. After the war, in 1947, um, Nervi is approached by the city of Turin, which is in the north sort of Italy's kind of industrial center. It's like the Detroit uh, of Italy. It's where fiats uh, have always traditionally been made. Um, Turin has decided that uh, as a way of kind of celebrating Italy's coming back into the, the, um, the Society of uh, Nations, um, they are going to host the International Auto Show uh, in 1948. And everyone is very excited about this. The only problem is that the exposition center, like the rest of Turin, was absolutely leveled by bombing during World War II. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the organizers have eight months, and they put out a, a call, basically, for proposals. And Nervi and Bartoli are the only firm that says, we think we can build a full-scale exposition hall in just eight months. And Salon B, which is the big uh, sort of corrugated hall, is the one that they built in 1947-48. The other one, Salone C, is off uh, to the back there. They build that after uh, the, the, um, the, the automobile exposition. And what Nervi does basically is to take the ferrocement technique that uh, he perfected in the shipyard and to apply it for the first time to a long span uh, roof. Um, these are uh, the drawings that uh, my student research team did. About halfway through, they started calling these the IKEA drawings uh, for, for Turin. And that's just about right, right? There is a, a process here where um, Nervi breaks the construction down into small, discrete uh, um, uh, uh, events that he can give to individual teams of unskilled laborers and say, just do this one thing, do it 108 times. When you're done, like just stack the finished products up in the job site yard while we're over here pouring the foundations. They build out of a brick and clay these molds over which uh, they take metal mesh, easy to get now that World War II is over. Uh, they bend those over the molds. Uh, they have uh, laborers trowel that uh, lightweight cement into those uh, metal mesh screens. They take those off of, of the molds, wait for them to cure, and literally just stack up these families of precast units uh, over and over and over. Uh, on the left, this is a Salone C, not Salone B, but you get the idea, right? Very, very crude techniques, very simple. They just require some simple instructions and then repeating those over and over again. On the right, that is the, the contractor's yard next to the, the Salone B, where you can see that as they're pouring the foundations, they have literally hundreds of these things lined up, right? Mass produced uh, using manual labor. <coughs> Um, Nervi uh, has broken the roof down into these small components so that they can be moved around, each one of them, by three or four workmen. And as you can see, again, it doesn't need a crane. Um, this is two guys with a pulley winching one of those uh, units in place. They're going to turn it, put it on uh, this traveling scaffold, slide it down a rail until it butts up against the, the member right beneath it. They'll grout those together. Once they get a complete arch, they'll pour a little concrete in the in channels in the top and bottom with some reinforcing. And what they'll end up with is a long span, kind of two hinged arch roof <clears throat> that is corrugated. So again, like it's kind of tricking the concrete into thinking it's very deep while in fact it's very thin. At the last minute, Nervi realizes that um, if you uh, take the material away from the neutral axis, and put glass in in its place, you'll get these very nice skylights, which bring light in on a, on a kind of regular uh, module. And at the end of each one of the hulls, to stiffen them while they're being moved around, he includes these V-shaped diaphragm walls. And at the end, when the things are all in place, and yes, it opened in time for the 1948 uh, exposition, um, what you get is this kind of dialogue between this gigantic span and the kind of very human scale that gets imprinted on that span because of the process. And once again, like almost accidentally, right? Nervi has, has not stopped to think about what this is gonna look like. All he's done is kind of paid attention to the process and how to get this job done in eight months. And at the end, you kind of stand back and the, and the rigor of the structural thinking coupled with the kind of human scale of the fabrication and construction have kind of almost accidentally again created like architecture, right? You can see at the back there's this little apse. Um, and this was a, a requirement that the, uh, 
the city, they wanted to have a place where like the prizes could be given, like an honorific sort of um, uh, space at the back of the, of the hall. And they insisted on making it a half dome, which makes perfect sense architecturally and makes absolutely no sense structurally. Because right? a dome only works really if you can complete the circle and if you can put some tension members down at the base to keep it from bursting. A half dome literally just wants to spread out, right? Wants to, to push its buttresses aside just, just like an arch. So Nervi is kind of confounded by this, right? It's bad enough that, that he has to build this thing in, in eight months. Now he has some architect's idea of what his structure is going to be, and he's got to build that too. Um, and he realizes that in addition to uh, trying to buttress the dome around its perimeter with this kind of um, semicircular roof that you can see, um, he has to save weight, right? The, the, one of the keys to making the dome work is to make it as light as possible. And what he does is he takes the, the ferrous cement idea that is structure in the main hall, and he realizes that you can use uh, that light ferrous cement, that thin uh, technique, to basically make coffering formwork for the dome. And so here on the left, you can see uh, another crew that's making these triangular and diamond-shaped pans kind of like hats, right? They've got a, a, a kind of void in the middle and then a thin brim around the edge. And when those are stacked up next to each other, the, the brims of the hats will form the bottom of these voids that will become concrete ribs. And the, the kind of diamond shapes will basically be coffers in the dome that will take out most of the dead weight. Um, they'll come back and they'll pour a couple inches of concrete over the surface. And what they'll end up with basically again is either a, a thick uh, concrete shell with most of its weight removed, or think about it another way, uh, a very, very thin shell concrete roof with this network of stiffening ribs uh, below it. Very sort of clever structural idea, executed again on a scale where two or three uh, workmen can lift each one of these units, and you get not only the half dome that the clients wanted, but this very intricate, the first of these spider web uh, kind of roofs uh, that Nerevi designs. And again, stepping back from it, a, a kind of um, rigorously conceived structural idea, uh, a very human scale production process, and kind of magically at the end, this, this work of great kind of architectural beauty. And this becomes, I think, one of the key techniques that Nerevi uses over and over again, this idea that you can make formwork not out of timber, which historically is difficult to do in Italy, but that you can actually make formwork out of concrete, and in particular out of ferro-cement. Um, almost right away, he applies this to a, a tobacco warehouse in Bologna, and what he does is he invents this kind of building machine, this kind of formwork machine that you see uh, on the left. Um, he puts uh, ferro-cement forms in the top, and you can see because they're ferro-cement instead of timber, he has a lot more freedom in what the shape of those forms can be. And he kind of, in a way, signs the building with the, these slab details. We're used to seeing waffle slabs where the, the uh, joists are just straight and just connected 90 degrees. Well, Nervi knows that as those joists approach the, their supporting girders, they collect more and more shear. And they don't necessarily have to get deeper, but they have to have more cross-sectional area. And so you can see that the ferrocement forms flare out and provide space uh, for, the, for the joists to get wider as they approach the, the beams, a kind of signature of more and more shear uh, in the connections uh, and not so much bending, which of course is, is maximum at the middle. Do you have to do this? No, of course not. You can just add more rebar, but Nervi thinks it's important. It's an opportunity to express kind of what's going on there. Um, again, not so many drawings of the warehouse itself, but loads and loads of drawings of uh, what Nerevi wants the finished slab to look like, and how these building machines are going to be built so that you can use one set of forms that here, instead of leaving them in place, uh, he oils them, they uh, cast a, a bit of floor, and after a couple days when the concretes come up to, to working strength, they can drop these forms down and move them to the next bay, right? So it's almost like they're just stamping one bay after another uh, in, into the air. Um, we had a lot of fun with this. Uh, we built not only the forms, but then we came around and built the, the slabs that went on top of them. And like, no surprise, right? You get the same pattern again and again and again. The um, warehouse is about an eighth of a mile long. And it's about sort of 80 or 90 feet wide. And so Nervi is thinking of the job site as an assembly line. 
and taking, in this case, they built 16 of these forms and they just kind of skipped after each other down uh, one floor. There was one crane at the end that would then pick them up and put them on top of the floor they had just made and they would come back. Right? So they just went back and forth like a, like a typewriter uh, for, for eight floors. Um, this building, like many other of Nerevi's buildings, is, is kind of a ruin. Um, it's possible to sneak in, though I didn't tell you that. And it has this incredibly beautiful floor slab, right? That, that um, if you're a kind of waffle slab connoisseur, right, this is how to do it right. Um, and it's just this little detail that Nervi must have known, you know, almost nobody was ever going to see. Um, but but the, the freedom that this formwork system has for him allows him to kind of sign the, the building. Um, slightly more famously, this is a, a wool warehouse on the outskirts of Rome. Uh, where someone in his office said, you know, you, you don't, you would, it's not just about tweaking the details, you can actually kind of reshape the whole kind of waffle slab into something that's much more structurally uh, uh, expressive. And so here, uh, the formwork is made so that the ribs actually trace the lines of isostatic force in the slab, right? You can actually visualize how the, the, the weight of, of the slabs is getting collected uh, over these column forms. Um, it was pointed out, even in Nervi's time, that um, this is the pattern for a flat slab, and that once you put ribs in that slab, the isostatic shapes change, and Nervi's response was like, come on, this is like a beautiful waffle slab, right? And, and interestingly, here he, he is interested in beauty, but he's interested in beauty that comes from a structure not just performing as structure, but also communicating its structure, right? Telling you something about how the, the slab works, or telling you something about how, okay, another slab works, but in a way that makes sense on, on, on this kind of um, on this kind of module. So all of this comes together in some of these great domes uh, that he builds, and um, the, the, uh, his kind of the turning point in his career um, is really the 1960 Olympics, uh, which are held in Rome, and, and Nervi at the time is, is pushing 70, so he's got a, a, a long career behind him already. Um, and this really starts as kind of the second phase of his career. Um, it's, it's a sort of astonishing thing for Italy to host the games. Like the Axis powers after World War II all hosted the Olympics within 30 years, uh, Japan, uh, Italy, and, and Germany. Italy was the first. And they proposed to do it in three ways. Um, they would, would use the ancient, some of the ancient sites. The marathon was run on the Via Appia. Wrestling took place in the Basilica of Maxentius. Um, they very frankly used a lot of the fascist buildings that had been built in the 30s. They thought instead of whitewashing the, the past, they wanted to be very clear about you know, the fact that, about acknowledging the fact that that, uh, that era had, had occurred. And then they built these new buildings that were going to host the, the really big um, really big events to show that Italy was kind of looking forward. A nice, nice bit of rhetoric. Um, the International Olympic Committee was skeptical that they could do this. And so in 1957, they were asked to build a demonstration project, uh, an arena that would show that they were capable of building the, these big arenas. Um, Nervi was on the, the committee that wrote the specs. And then he turned around and was the only firm that bid on those specs. Right, so Nervi is not only a, a great engineer, but he was also a, an absolute shark of a, of a businessman. Um, and the way he proposed to do this was to take that technique that he had used in the apse of the Turin Hall and to kind of blow it up uh, in scale. So on the left, this is the job site yard. Uh, this is going on while they're digging the foundations. You can see that he's got all of these diamond-shaped pans that have that kind of hat-like section. And you can also see that it only takes a couple of workmen to move a couple of those over to the job site. On the right, you can see them tiling the surface of the dome with these diamond pans. These got left in place. Nervi realized that this meant that you could get a, a reliable finish on the interior, right? You weren't um, so worried. You didn't have to be worried about what was going to happen when you peeled the formwork off. And you can see that there is a crane to lift all the pieces into place. Um, they uh, refined the process down to the point where they only needed to rent the crane for 60 days. And they tiled the entire surface and got, took the crane down and got it off the job site uh, in just two months. So very, very efficient. You can see, too, that there are only a handful of, uh, of construction workers on top of the dome. 
Um, so they were able to kind of refine not only the schedule, but also the amount uh, of labor that it took. So they then came back, they poured a, a thin shell dome over this formwork that's reinforcing in the bottom of what are going to become the ribs. Um, and the dome was held up, or is held up, on this ring of fork-shaped, poured-in-place buttresses that go to a tension ring that's buried in the, in the, the, the ground beneath it. Um, impressive enough from the outside, right? a giant a concrete dome that's literally supported on these forks. Um, and absolutely breathtaking when you walk into it. Um, I've, I've led probably eight or nine tours of this building, and literally every time people are talking and sort of um, conversing with each other as they walk in, and it goes dead silent. Because this is such an impressive space, not because it's so huge, but because it's a big enough span that's broken down into this very, very human scale, right? Every one of those diamonds is an element that three or four guys could pick up. And it's up in the air, right? It, it's surrounded by this glass curtain wall. Um, it got called a, a concrete pantheon, right? It's only a, a few miles from the Roman pantheon, so the comparison is kind of obvious. And Nervi got tired of this and, and finally pointed out to one journalist that you know, it's easy to bring light in at the top of the dome. And he had found a way to actually bring daylight in from underneath the dome. Right? So the whole thing feels like it's hovering. It feels very, very lightweight. Again, though, this is a, a system that is handmade. Right? There's only a crane on site for 60 days. Um, the, the, the sort of um, almost punchline to this is that Nervi realizes that um, you know, usually you start with the earthwork and then you build the roof on top of that. And Nervi realizes that actually what you want to do is you want to build the foundations at the outside, and then you want to build the roof, and then you want to come in with your excavators and build and dig and build the actual bowl of the seating. Because then you're out of the rain, right? You've built your own kind of weather guard over the, the job site. On time, on budget, uh, the International Olympic Committee has to admit that Italy can probably pull this off. Um, Nervi, uh, again, writes specs for a bunch of the buildings, gets a lot of them, and finally gets told when it comes to the velodrome, like, enough, right? You've, you've, you've done enough. But he does four or five projects for the Olympics, including um, the, the Palazzo dello Sport. Right? Palazzo means tiny palace of sport. The Palazzo dello Sport, which is a span that's about half again as large as, as the Palazzo, is one where, interestingly, he goes back to the Turin roof idea. This is a corrugated ferro cement roof, but instead of being extruded, it's now on a rotational grid. So they're all kind of these long, skinny wedges. Uh, ferro cement, but broken down into small pieces that can be uh, moved around by hand. Um, and he throws kind of every technique he has at this. You can see these kind of uh, raking buttresses around the outside. This was another um, port in place technique that he developed for creating wooden surfaces out of timber formwork. Um, it's a much bigger space. Um, it's not quite as, uh, as, as kind of architecturally appealing, I think, because there's so much going on. But again, it has this combination of incredible span and very, very fine-grained detail right? that, that sort of imprints the human scale uh, onto this big span. Um, and it was really uh, these buildings that um, elevated Nervi from kind of uh, cult hero to architects and engineers into international superstar. Um, the 1960 games were the first Olympics to be televised worldwide. And so when Cassius Clay, later Muhammad Ali, uh, won the gold medal in boxing. Um, he, uh, the title bout and the medal ceremony both were under the Palazzo's dome. So millions of people worldwide see not only the athletic competitions, but they see them underneath these incredibly kind of finely scaled roofs. And Nervi achieves this, this measure of celebrity that's very unusual for an engineer uh, in the 1960s. Among other things, the Palazzo shows up again and again and again as this kind of symbol of Italy's progress. Um, here in uh, Vogue magazine in 1964, this is, should be a career goal for all of you. Your building should end up in Vogue someday. Um, you can see that it's elegant enough for a, a fashion shoot. And Nervi's buildings show up again and again and again in Italian cinema of the 1960s. So here in Antonioni film, uh, Le Clisse, uh, which takes place in the neighborhood around the Palazzo. And all of these kind of long conversations, you know, art house Italian film, right, full of these long kind of perambulating conversations 
they take place with the palazzo in the background. That it's, it's a symbol of um, kind of Italy's uh, prowess, not only in fashion, but also in, kind of in sort of science and technology. And this exposure uh, starts Nerebi's career as a kind of consulting architect. And he does uh, these buildings in the last couple decades of his life, um, where he pairs up with people in uh, different countries. None of these have quite the rigor or quite the power that the, the buildings that he does in Italy uh, have. And I think that's because he's kind of farming out the actual construction. Right? Someone else is on site. Um, they're often borrowing the same techniques, but they never seem to have quite the, the, the depth that the actual kind of narrowly built buildings have. So here, um, Australia Square in Sydney with Harry Seidler. Um, the correspondence between Seidler and Nervi is really funny because Seidler is just such a, a kind of fan and he'll send Nervi kind of sketches and ideas that he must know are, are fine. And Nervi writes back and says, yes, you know, you're doing it right, that's great. Um, and Seidler kind of goes off and builds it. Um, with Pietro Belusky, uh, St. Mary's Cathedral uh, in San Francisco where this uh, diamond or triangular shaped pan form is used uh, to create a, these four high par shells that, that lean together and form a cross of the ceiling. Um, and then, kind of locally, uh, up in Hanover, um, there we actually does two sports buildings, an indoor track uh, and this ice arena. These are the buttresses on the exterior, and the interior of Thompson Arena uh, is fascinating to me because it's the, it's the sort of shape of the Turin Hall, but it's the technique of the Palazzetto. These are all um, ferro cement pans that are used to form and then to kind of uh, finish uh, thin shell concrete uh, on, the, on the exterior. So to finish, um, among the, the invitations that Nervi gets in the wake of the Olympics, um, he is invited by Harvard University to give the Charles Eliot Norton Lectures in Poetry in 1961. And that is a, a pretty telling moment that a structural engineer um, someone who is trained in the kind of really like hardcore mathematics and the, the kind of you know, dirty hands job site of, of concrete construction and engineering um, gets recognized as a, as a poet. Um, he gives a series of lectures that he later calls Aesthetics and Technology and Building and he works very hard to try to distill his philosophy down into something that um, the, the, the kind of kids of Harvard can, can understand. And this um, quote, I keep coming back to because I think it contains so much of what he believed and so much of what I think makes his building stand out uh, from his contemporaries. Aesthetics is very important to him. Right? He understands that, that we have this innate desire to do beautiful things, right? to be in beautiful buildings. And he says that that comes from two sources. Right? Uh, one of them is the objective data of the problem. So static form for him is a universal language. A cantilever in Hanover, New Hampshire, wants to be the same shape as a cantilever in Milan, Italy. Right? No matter where you are, the statics are kind of universal. Um, they may be empirical or scientific, so those are scientific. The empirical uh, data of the problem might be that we have no steel, we have no timber, we're forced to work in concrete. Uh, or we have plenty of steel, so you know maybe uh, the, the formula is a little bit different uh, when he's working in America. Interestingly, he says that these only suggest the solutions and forms. We sometimes have this idea that, um, you know, that, that structure is somehow determinate, right? That, that it tells you what your form has to be. And Mary says, no, this, there's all kinds of ways that, that you can span a, a space. We know that there might be certain solutions that we see again and again, but these are just suggestions. And the agency lies within the designer. Right? The aesthetic sensitivity of the designer understands the intrinsic beauty and validity that these suggestions might have, um, that has to welcome them, and then it's us, like we model those suggestions. We punctuate them, we emphasize them. We have this kind of personal way of dealing with them that is the artistic element. And it's not that art and science are opposed, it's that they're in this dialogue that I think you see particularly in his work. Interestingly, um, there are a couple of kind of dualities in this that, that may not be evident at first. Technology and statics. When Nervi talks about technology, he's talking about construction. When he talks about statics, obviously he's talking about structure. These two things do not always fit together easily. Right? And, and we've seen how Nervi tries to create ideal shapes 
but he has to achieve them in ways that take advantage of the few resources that he often has with him. And I think more importantly, that architecture, engineering, like design in general, um, is always this dialogue between the kind of ideal world that's out there, the kind of Atsi world of mathematics, um, and, and, the, and the, the kind of um, you know, dirty hands world of, of Lugia, uh, and this much more refined realm that all of our buildings kind of aspire to. Nervi collected Renaissance art. Uh, he read you know, Dante for, for kind of fun. He was definitely kind of aesthetically sensitive, trained. He was able to take that sensibility and apply it back to these quote unquote uh, objective data. Um, I'll just close by saying that uh, in addition to um, uh, the, in addition to, the, to my study on Nervi, um, I was part of a team that uh, reissued or republished um, these lectures by Nervi, Aesthetics and Technology and Building, um, with a, a bunch of historians writing about what those essays kind of meant at the time and have meant since. Um, so this is now newly available. Uh, available previously only for a couple hundred bucks on eBay um, and now it's uh, it's out in, in this uh, new edition and I'll leave you with um, Nervi sitting at the table contemplating who knows what but surrounded even in uh, his, his kind of elderly years with that picture on the upper left that Vasari picture of those early hangers um, conceived out of these incredibly rigorous conditions and yet almost kind of um, uncannily touching our ideals of, of architectural Thanks very much. Yeah, so would you take a question or two? Absolutely. Do we have any? I was wondering if you could say a word about Nervi's influence on or relationship to contemporary experiments in construction, digital manufacturing, tensile structures, and mm -hmm. parametrics, and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, his influence has been kind of diffuse. Um, there are certainly engineers who claim him as a kind of um, influence. Um, Calatrava is the obvious one. Uh, but Calatrava is not a builder. I mean, he doesn't build his own work. And I, I think that kind of, I think that um, a lot of his designs sort of lack the, the discipline to kind of distill Nervi's work into something else. Um, I think that the, the the strongest influence is in the, the use of geometry and in the use of kind of thinking about structure as um, not only the finished product, but also the kind of algorithms that produce the shapes, right? How do we actually get these geometric ideas into the, into the world? And so, um, you know, I look at uh, things like diagrid structures or um, the example that I used in the book is, is Foster's roof over the British Library, which takes a kind of structural form and breaks it down into you know, bits of glass and metal that, that you could actually make with a kind of simple patterning process. Um, even then, right, even when British Library was done, we didn't have the, the kind of information capacity that we do today. Today we don't think twice about um, you know, panels that might be a thousand different shapes, we just send it off to the CNC machine, they kind of cut it. Um, there we had to think about how you create you know, families of shapes that you use again and again and again, right? He's in a mass production kind of era. Um, that doesn't translate perfectly today. And we also don't build spans this big out of concrete so much every day, right? The economics have changed. I think it's more in that kind of bigger idea that you know, geometry and pattern and the, the kind of algorithms of how we make stuff underlie all of these different approaches. And that there is a kind of the relationship between what we build, how it performs, and how we actually get those forms you know, out of the factory or out of the shop onto the site. I think that's probably where it's influence has been most profound. Any, any other questions? I can throw one at you, Tom. Um, so where does this fall in uh, Millington's definition of structural art? <laughs> um, I'm sure you've thought about it. Oh, I've thought about it. Uh, <laughs> and it's not the first, first time I've been asked that. Um, so Billington, for those who don't know, is the kind of, um, I, would, I would say he's like one of the founders of kind of structural history in a way. And the coiner of this term, structural art, um, Billington was trained as an engineer, 
taught engineering at Princeton for years and years and years, hugely influential. Um, and in almost none of his writing do you ever see anything about construction or about fabrication. It's all about the shape and the form and how closely that relates to some static ideal. This, I think, is what you would expect from someone who has a fairly highfalutin engineering education and has never had to deal with a former contractor screaming at them on the job site. Um, so I take very gentle issue with the kind of Billington stance that talks about structural art. I think that what that is is really architecture. And I think that it is the kind of, you know, it comes from these three places, right? These, the ideal forms, which are absolutely out there, uh, but to actually get those ideal forms, like us working slobs have to figure out how you're actually going to make them and how you're going to get all these pieces up there, how you're going to create, you know, the, the ideal form. And so there's this dialogue that I think Billington doesn't always quite get. Um, and to me, that, um, that makes it messier and more complicated, but also much more interesting. And it means that as designers, I think it gives us more latitude because as, as Nervi said, you know, it's not that the structural ideal is telling you what to do. And I sometimes think this is what Billington kind of thought. Um, it's that it's saying, here's a kind of range of options. Right? And some of them might be easier than others depending on whether you live in a country with lots of native steel or if you know, the labor versus materials equation is different, then maybe your form gets impacted a little bit. To me, that opens it up in a way that allows room for us to come in and make the decisions. That's a good tie into that quote. All right, well, maybe perhaps uh, Tom will take a question or two up at the podium as you're filing out, and I believe we have a light uh, collation outside for those of us who are here. So thanks again, Tom. Yeah.